I want to, again, I want to thank you for your patience as we try to process all these people coming in, but it being 7.30 and 30 minutes after the original time expected for this meeting, I will ask that this meeting please come to order. Will the clerk please read the call of the meeting and return of service. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Town of Duxbury, Special Town Meeting Warrant, Monday, October 17, 2022, at 7 o'clock p.m., Duxbury Performing Arts Center, 73 Alden Street, Duxbury, Mass. Plymouth SS, greetings to the Constable of the Town of Duxbury in said county. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are directed to notify and warn the inhabitants of the Town of Duxbury qualified to vote in elections and in town affairs to meet in the Duxbury Performing Arts Center, 73 Alden Street in said Duxbury on Monday, the 17th day of October, 2022, next at seven o'clock p.m. for the transaction of any business that may legally come before said meeting. And you are hereby directed to serve this warrant by posting attested copies thereof as prescribed by Mass General Law, Chapter 39, Section 10, and by Chapter 2, Section 2.3.1 of the Town of Duxbury General Bylaws, at least 14 days before the time of holding said meeting. Hereof fail not and make due return of this warrant with your doings thereon to the town clerk at the time and place of this meeting. Given under our hands this 26th day of September, 2022, Duxbury Select Board, Fernando Guitart Chair, Cynthia Ladd Fiorini, Vice Chair, Michael McGee, Clerk, Theodore J. Flynn, Amy M. McNabb. Plymouth SS, September 28, 2022. Pursuant to the warrant, I have this day notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Duxbury, here and described, to meet at the time and place and for the purposes as described by the bylaws of the town. A true copy attested, Mitchell LeBret, Constable of Duxbury. Unless there's some objection, we'll dispense with the reading of the warrant. I want to thank the Duxbury Police Department for the honor guard in presenting the colors, and I ask that you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to introduce some of the people you see facing you in the front of the hall. They are on your right, my left. Um, Selectwoman Amy McNabb, uh, Selectman Theodore Flynn, Selectman Michael McGee, uh, Select, Selectwoman Cheryl Ladd Fornini, uh, and Selectman Ferdinand Guitart. Next to him is, yes, I'm sorry about your name. I apologize. In fact, I apologize right now to everybody whose name I will get confused. <laughs> You're laughing, and, and it's also all way too true. Uh, sitting, sitting next to the Fernando is uh, our town finance director. Thank you for turning around. Uh, and our town administrator. Um, up here on the platform with me are, is the town clerk, Susan Kelly, to my immediate left, and assistant town clerk, Linda Silvati. And over in what appears to be the uh, penalty box is Town Council Jeffrey Blake. <laughs> On my right, your left, the, is the Finance Committee. And in no particular order, we have uh, Chair Betsy Sullivan, um, Vice Chair, Friend Weiler, uh, Kathleen Glynn, uh, Shannon Godden, um, Al Hoban, Jeff... Um, Jerry Pisani, Jackson S. Kent, Jr., uh, um, Sean 
Dotson Foley. How did I do? Close. Well, that's as good as it gets some days. <laughs> and Nathaniel Taylor. My name is John Tuffy, and I'm the town moderator. Um, I'd like to review with you certain town meeting procedures before we formally start. Upon checking in and before checking in and registering, registered voters were issued a handheld voting device. The voting device enables you to be seated in the voting section. The voting devices are color coded and, and will only work in a voting section of the same color. For this meeting, everybody is all in the same color. Um, if you have any issues with your voting device, please go to the teller's desk, which is in the hallway outside the main entrance of this room, and they will issue a new one. The voting process will be as follows. After a debate is over, I will call for a vote. A light will go on. The green light to my left will go on. I was, a light will go on. You'll have 20 seconds to vote. If you press one, that's yes. If you press two, that's no. Um, if you decide to change your mind, you don't need to clear the device, just press the right button. One for yes, two for no. At the bottom of that little window, you will see a, a notice that says received. That means your vote has been processed and counted. Again, if you, you, if you want to change it, you can change it up until any time that light goes out or turns red. Um, if, the, if the handheld voting system fails, we will use a voice vote or hand count. If I'm unable to determine there is a majority by a voice vote, we will use a hand count. If seven or more voters immediately question my determination, we will have a hand count. Um, if you want to question that, if you just stand up and we can go around and count one through seven. If a hand count becomes necessary, the voting device must be held up when the vote is counted. The tellers have been instructed to count only votes cast by persons who are holding a voting device in their hands and are seated in the voting section. To assure accuracy, all hand votes will be counted by two tellers. This may require some additional time and we request your cooperation in the process. As part of the check-in procedure, the vote tellers have been authorized and instructed by the Board of Registrars to request positive identification in case of doubt. The hall today will be divided into six sections, numbered as follows. Section one is the small section on the main floor in front to my left. Section two is the center section of the front. Section three is the small section to my right. Section four is the section of the balcony to the rear to my left. Section five is the center of the balcony to the rear. And section six is the section of the balcony to my right. Visitors will be seated in the rear section of section one to my left that is the non-voting section. It is my sincere hope that we don't have to deal with any of that, that we can just use our voting devices. It is so much cleaner. Microphones for use, your use are located in the back of the hall at the foot of, foot of each of the balcony aisles where they meet the stairs down to the main floor, behind voting sections one and three on the main floor and here in front between the selectmen and finance committee's table. Assisted listing devices are available at the table next to the entrance to the main floor. They are provided by the Municipal Commission on Disabilities. Fire Chief has requested that I point out fire exits in this room. There are two fire exits on the lower level of the auditorium. One on my immediate right, your left, and one on my left when you entered the room. There are also two fire exits at the upper level of the room at the rear of the hall behind the balconies. Please do not block these exits by standing or placing anything in front of them. The seating capacity for this room is 1,030. I think we're going to be okay. Um, in fact, there's quite a bit of room still open, and if you are at all uncomfortable sitting next to somebody, please feel free, free to change your seat and get a little space between your, between your fellow voters. I request that all cell phones be turned off while the meeting is in session except for public safety officials. And for your information, this meeting is being taped. At this point in our town meetings, we customarily vote to give permission to non-voters to speak to, to speak. We give that permission to town employees, officials who are not registered voters in the town of Duxbury, and invited guests. I will entertain a motion to allow our town employees, officials, and invited guests to speak should the occasion arise. So do I, moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Now is a good time to, uh, to test out our voting devices. 
You'll have 20 seconds to register your vote. One for yes, two for no. Voting is stopped, and the, and the motion passes 293 to 17, 310 people. That's quite a lot for a special town meeting, and I'm not sure everybody vote necessarily voted. Um, this meeting is governed by the statutes uh, of our town bylaw and a in town meeting time. In addition, I suggest we abide by the following procedures so that we may conduct the business of the meeting in an orderly fashion. After I've announced that we are considering an article, the article will be moved by the Finance Committee and their recommendations will be heard. I will give the proposer of the article the opportunity of making their opening remarks. In those cases where there is an organized opposition, which has been pointed out to me, I will then give the opponent of the article the opportunity of making their opening remarks. I request that all presenters limit their remarks to a maximum of 10 minutes. Upon completion of these presentations, the matter will be open for general debate. If you wish to speak, I request that you go to one of the microphones. After you've been recognized by me, I would, and would you please identify yourself by name and street address. I also request that all speakers limit their remarks to a maximum of five minutes and ask that speakers do not attempt to be recognized for a second time on the discussion of any article until every other person who wishes to speak has had an opportunity to do so for the very first time. Any lengthy or complicated motions or amendments should be submitted in writing so that we will know precisely what is being voted upon and so that we can maintain an accurate record of the proceedings. Town Council is available to assist if you have any questions about the drafting of any such motion. There are a couple of procedures I just want to mention quickly. One is a motion for the previous question, sometimes known as move the question. It is a motion that ends debate and it takes a two-thirds vote. A useful motion with town meetings when uh, you feel that we've heard enough or we're hearing the same kind of argument over and over again, um, it does move the meeting along. However, I have some concerns that it will be abused or used unfairly and to that end we have two procedures that will follow. One is I will not accept a motion for the previous question from someone who has just finished speaking on an article to eliminate a, uh, an opportunity to get in the last word. And second, um, is intended to assure that proponents and opponents of an article will have an opportunity to speak before debate is ended. So until the article is open to general debate, I will not accept a motion to move the previous question. Um, we do have some rules around reconsideration. Um, very quickly, they a, mo a motion for re to reconsider requires the same quantitative vote as the original motion. It must be made at the same session as the original motion or the next succeeding session. It is my sincere hope that we're going to finish up tonight and there will be no succeeding session, but that's up to you. It may only be one made once, um, and it may only be considered if the proponent provides, in the opinion of the moderator, factual information that was not available during the session when the original motion was taken. And then finally, if we are unable to finish the special town meeting tonight, I will ask for a motion to recess until tomorrow, Tuesday, October 18th, at this location. And now for the business of the special town meeting, Mrs. Sullivan, I'm going to ask for a, a motion on, on Article 1. Article 1 is the acceptance of a private way and have it become a town way. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that, Article 1, I move that the town accept as a public way the roadway known as McLean's Way as heretofore laid out by the select board and shown on a plan of land entitled Street Acceptance Plan for McLean's Way, Duxbury, Massachusetts, dated January 7, 2020 prepared by Grady Consulting, LLC, and on file with the town clerk, and to authorize the select board to acquire by gift purchase and or eminent domain the fee to and or easements in McLean's way 
for all purposes for which public ways are used in the town of Duxbury and any drainage, access, utility, and or other easements related thereto. Second. The select Board voted 5-0 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 7-0 to recommend. Are there any questions? Um, any discussion on this article? If you'll please come to a microphone and identify yourself. Uh, Sue Schofield, James Road. I'm just wondering what the cost is to the town. Do we have somebody who can provide an answer to that? Mr. Butkus, our DPW director, is coming forward. The reason I ask is that the road that I currently live on is full of potholes and there's a lot of burden to the town with the roads that we currently have. So when McLean Road comes in or a new development comes in, are there HOAs that they're currently taking care of their own needs? Well, once the town accepts it, then it's our responsibility. But we haven't accepted. So what I'm saying is how is McLean Way or Road, how are they handling it now? Right, but so. My road <laughs> needs some love from the town. So I'm just, you know, I always ask, what is the cost? There's a cost to everything. So oh, yeah. just, I know, and I know you don't have a number. I'm just pointing it out. That's all. Thank you. Th thank you. Any other questions or comments? Gentleman in, in the back, my left. Hello, my name is Dean Sorelli, 15 McLean's Way. My wife Evelyn and I moved to Duxbury four years ago and we found our home at McLean's. Some families in our neighborhood are newcomers like us. Jess and Max Cohen and their two young daughters, Joanne and Bill Murphy. Others are long-standing Duxbury residents who've been part of our community for decades and who've raised their children here. Debbie and Al O'Neill, Mary Ann and Emily, Mary Ann and Emil Reinharder, and Debbie and Bob Greenglass. Many here will recognize Debbie Greenglass for her many years of dedication teaching in the Duxbury school system. We all chose to live in Duxbury to be part of this wonderful community. Together, here, tonight, we ask for your support to make McLean's Way a public road for our town. We thank the Select Board and the Finance Committee for their unanimous votes and time and consideration accepting our street as a public road. Please join us then and vote yes to make McLean's Way a public way in Duxbury. Thank you. Ms. McNeil, I, I sense you have a comment. Um, it's important to know here that uh, the select board and the finance committee uh, to, to this, to Ms. Schofield's uh, point, um, arbitrarily or without, without uh, consideration of the fact that in this case, the development was proven to us that the developer.
that you live Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote at this time. All those in, in favor of article number one, the acceptance of McLean's way, please press one. All those opposed, press two. Voting is open. Voting is closed. The vote, vote passes 303 to 68. Well, article number two, Mrs. Sullivan, it is a land purchase article. Um, it, article two, the um, Ricker land purchase, two thirds vote required. I move that the town, as recommended by the Community Preservation Committee, A, authorize the select board to acquire by purchase, gift, or eminent domain, and on such terms and conditions as the select board deems to be in the best interests of the town, for agricultural purposes, all or a portion of the parcel of land located at 293 Mayflower Street, approximately shown as town purchased 35.9 plus acres on a plan entitled Work Plan 293 Mayflower Street, dated November 29th, 2021, and dated last revised December 30th, 2021, prepared by Stenbeck and Taylor, Inc., a copy of which is on file with the town clerk, and described in deeds recorded with the Plymouth Registry of Deeds in Book 4041, page 96, and Book 3741, page 225, subject to easements reserved for the benefit of the lot shown as Ricker House Lot on said plan, which parcel shall be under the care, custody, and control of the Conservation Commission pursuant to the provisions of General Law Chapter 40, Section 8C, and a right of first refusal and option to purchase the parcel shown on said plan as the Ricker House Lot. B, appropriate, appro appropriate sorry, the sum of $1,600,000 for the purpose of funding said acquisition and costs incidental or related thereto, of which 600,000 is transferred from the Community Preservation Unreserved Undesignated Fund Balance, 100,000 is transferred from the Open Space Reserve, 300,000 is transferred from the Water Enterprise Retained Earnings, and the remaining 600,000 is borrowed and to authorize the treasurer with the approval of the select board to borrow 600,000 sum under Mass General Law Chapter 44B, Section 11, and or any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes on the town therefore. C, authorize the select board to grant a restriction on said parcel pursuant to the provisions of General Law Chapter 184, sections 31 through 33, in compliance with General Law Chapter 44B, Section 12A. And further, D, authorize the Select Board in consultation with the Conservation Commission to enter into a management agreements from time to time for up to 10 years, as may be necessary for the purpose of this article on such terms deemed by the Select Board 
in consultation with the Conservation Commission to be in the best interests of the town. Second. Recommendations, the select board voted 5-0 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 7-0 to recommend. Um, well, hello, Ms. Rufo, you are speaking for the Conservation Commission. Article 2 for your consideration, the Ricker land purchase. Um, first, there's a, um, about a five-minute video presentation um, to show you on the property. Nancy, 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 and I am the Conservation Administrator for the Town of Duxbury. I have held this position for approximately six weeks, replacing longtime Administrator Joe Grady. Joe is actually the reason why I'm here today and able to present Article 2 for your consideration, the Ricker Land Purchase. Over many, many years, Joe established a relationship with Earl Ricker, or Rick as he's known to many, that resulted in Rick coming to the town, and specifically Joe, when he recently decided to retire and sell a large portion of his land. This land purchase totals almost 36 acres on Mayflower Street and includes approximately 14 acres of working cranberry bogs. The Ricker family has owned these bogs since the 1920s and have been in the cranberry business for over 100 years. There are two bogs on the property. The main bog is approximately eight acres, and the smaller Mayflower bog is approximately six acres. The main bog is unique in that it is one of the few fresh fruit bogs that remains active locally. These berries are of a higher quality, resulting in a higher price. They are the berries that you buy in bags when you go to the grocery store. The remaining bogs are wet harvested, which involves flooding the bogs, knocking the berries off the vines, and corralling them for removal. Typically, these berries are used for other products you see on store shelves, such as juices and sauces. This fall, over the next few weeks, Rick and his family will harvest their final crop. Moving forward, if the town decides to purchase the land, we will enter into a management agreement prior to closing with a grower who has experience with our other bogs and actually helps on the Ricker bogs currently, so he is very familiar with the operation. Due to the fresh fruit component of these bogs, pets, including dogs, have always been and will continue to be prohibited from the property. Also worth noting, the Ricker bogs have ocean spray A pool delivery rights, which are transferable to the town. This designation makes the crop more valuable on the cranberry market. Now you may be asking why the town would want to purchase this land. Aside from the meticulously maintained bogs, there are several compelling reasons, including for the purpose of water protection, farming, agriculture, open space, and historic preservation. This land acquisition meets all five goals of the 2017 Open Space and Recreation Plan. It wraps around the evergreen wells to protect our drinking water, it preserves Duxbury's natural environment and its unique character. It protects open space and provides walking trails. There is also a historic element with several cart paths on the property, two of which are easily identified and still used today. In terms of financial considerations, the property was appraised in January of 2022 for $1.5 million and that is the price agreed upon between the Rickers and the town. 
An additional $100,000 will be added to this amount for associated costs, including legal fees, survey work, and putting a conservation restriction on the property as a portion of the purchase will be with Community Preservation Act funds. Therefore, the total for this article is $1.6 million. Funding will come from several sources. $600,000 from the Community Preservation Act undesignated fund balance, $300,000 from the Water Enterprise Fund, $100,000 from the Open Space Community Preservation Act account, and $600,000 in borrowing, the debt of which would be retired using future CPA funds. In addition to the appraisal, a Phase 1 environmental assessment was conducted on the property by an outside consultant in September of 2022, resulting in no concerns or further action being required on the site. Finally, I did want to mention the Rickers are not selling their entire parcel. Rick and his wife, Roxy, will remain in their home located at 293 Mayflower Street, which is in approximately 1.8 acre parcel of land and includes a barn. The town does have right of first refusal when the time comes that the Rickers decide to sell this as well. But until that time, please be mindful and respect their privacy around their home site. In summary, please vote yes on Article 2 for the town to purchase this unique and significant piece of property from the Rickers at special town meeting on October 17th. Thank you. So I do have a couple of slides just summarizing what you just heard in case um, people have questions, I can go back to them. And then I was going to put the uh, property map up as well, so I can refer to that if people have questions. Let's see, so these are some summary points. Sorry, there we go. Okay. So happy to answer any questions. Hi, I'm Mark McDevitt, Chestnut Street. Uh, I'm curious why the debt component is being funded by the cash strapped CPA and not a general obligation bond issued by the town. It seems like we're stealing the lollipop from the baby who's here to ask for more anyways. I'm going to defer that question to Holly Morris, chair of the CPC. Good question. Um, I'm Holly Morris, the chair of the CPC. Uh, we have been looking at this property for many, many years, and we currently have the funds to do this um, and to cover the debt on that property. Um, okay, quick follow-up, if I may. Just quickly. Just, qu just quickly, and then we'll go on to the next. Um, I'm not familiar with how much the CPA can leverage its income from the contributions we make every year. And I'm wondering, is there a limitation? Um, can you incur more debt than you can service on one year's worth of? No, of course not. Um, what, it, what is, uh, this has been factored in with the, um, the funds that we currently have, and we can cover this right now. Going forward, we, we really can't. <laughs> um, we're essentially at the bottom of the bucket, if you will. We still have a reserve. We have about, you know, after this purchase, we will have about 400,000 in our undesignated fund balance. Um, but the other accounts, uh, the open space account, is going to be drawn down to about 100,000. It's tight. It's really tight. 
But this is a CPA project. Um, we, have been, again, have been looking at this. Um, it was intended to be covered as a CPA project, and currently we have the funds to do that. Is your question if we can service our debt? It, it's a combination of, number one, since this is tapping out the CPA, why isn't the town just issuing new debt for 600000 and leaving you the money in the bank, so to speak? So we are hoping, in the next article, to bring that CPA surcharge up to 3% if we can. Um, because we know that there are other purchases out there, other lands to look at. We have other purposes, such as um, recreation, housing, um, historic preservation. And so we need to address all of those things. But that's why CPA is there versus going to the general fund. The gentleman in the, in the gray sweater. Edward Newell, 12 Rachel Lane. I'm wondering, do the conservation restrictions on this parcel prohibit the town from selling any uplands from this parcel in the future? Yes, this will be protected it's permanently under, the, restricted. Yes, under the conservation yes. restrictions. Thank you. Um, I think the gentleman has been pacing back and forth patiently. Which you, one? no, you, sir. <laughs> Kevin Mahoney, 25 Mellon's Cove. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious, you referenced that you've purchased other cranberry bogs in this that are operating and you're leasing them. What revenue do you anticipate getting back from this bog and what are you actually getting back from the previous ones you purchased? Um, so the revenue from the bogs varies depending on the cranberry market. Um, we're not really using these bogs as a money-making venture. It's more of an opportunity for farmers to farm the land. Um, if it gets to a certain threshold, then the town does make money, but that's not the purpose of the yeah, purchase. I'm not asking if you're making money. I'm asking you what revenue you're receiving. We're not receiving. You're not receiving any revenue? Oh, the lease, I'm sorry, yes. From the leases that you're, you're purchasing in this land, part of your presentation was that, you know, you're gonna lease this back to growers. What are we actually getting back? In revenue. We don't have that. Uh, I may defer to Joe Grady. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, Joe Grady, uh, 10 Wendell Pond Road. Um, the, the management agreements, they're not leases, they're management agreements, are, as Nancy says, on a sliding scale. Generally speaking, it's understood that it costs approximately $35 to raise one barrel of cranberries. Um, so usually if the, in these agreements, the, uh, there's, there's no payment to the town if it's 30 or $40 a barrel. If it goes to $50 a barrel, we may see 5 or 10%. We presently have seven management agreements. Each of them is slightly different. Um, but generally speaking, if you get to $40, you may get 5%. $50, you get 10%. $60, you get 20%. In the late 80s, the town of Duxbury made a million dollars off of the fruit that we sold from the cranberry bogs. In those days, the, the fruit was selling for $60, $65 a barrel. Uh, right now, uh, it's expected that these berries this year will sell for something in the range of $40 a barrel. So it is conceivable that the town may see some revenue from some of their cranberry bogs in the future if the price continues to rise. But for the last few years, it's been below $40 a barrel, and the town has not received any funding from these properties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman over here with the brown yeah, vest. Yeah. yeah, Rod Saris, Valley Street. I just want to know if the town is going to be the sole owner of the Ocean Spray delivery contract, and does the town 
or is the town a sole owner of any other Ocean Spray delivery contracts? Yes, the um, Ocean Spray delivery rights will be transferred to the town and the other bogs in town do have Ocean Spray rights. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Tanya Trevison, 21 Tinkers Ledge Road. Um, there's been some concern recently about the farmers at the Gifford Mary Bogs using glyphosate uh, in the cranberry bogs to uh, control weeds, which has um, definitely some known um, carcinogen effects um, on the public health. And it was discussed, I believe, at the Gifford, at the purchase of the Gifford Mary Bogs, that the town wasn't interested in getting into the cranberry business, but to preserve it as conservation land. So my concern here is that the article is expressly indicating that it's for agricultural purposes, and the intent is um, to have the growers or farmers continue to grow there. And I'm wondering what assurances the town will look for um, to make sure that the farming is safe and glyphosate is not utilized on those bogs. Um, I am aware of the glyphosate discussion. Glyphosate is used on this bog in a very responsible manner. Um, Mr. Ricker is a certified applicator. Um, it's very sparingly used to the point that it is um, wiped um, onto the actual um, weeds that they're trying to eradicate. It's not sprayed. Um, and in our management agreements, there are integrated pest management ag agreements within them. So it's, it's very heavily regulated and controlled. Um, just a follow-up question. Is, you had mentioned that the farmer of one of the um, bogs or several bogs that are currently owned by the town will probably be um, taking over the farming of this mm -hmm. bog. Is, is, is that farmer um, aware of this issue and um, is it the same as the farmer that's in charge of the Gifford Mary bog now? Um, he, yes, and he is aware of the issue. Thank you. Gentleman in the back on my right. Hi, uh, Paul Boudreau, 153 Island Creek Road. I'm on a butter of this bog. I've been in a butter for almost for over 16 years. Um, a neighbor of, of Earl's, uh, a neighbor. Um, I could not have a better neighbor. This, he's an incredible, incredible man, and he takes care of that bog like. Um, most people in this town take care of their, their front lawns. Um, this is by far the most beautiful bog in the town of Tuxbury, in my opinion. You know, how many people come over to our house and look out the back window and see this and say, I've never seen a more beautiful bog. It's, I think it's a wonderful thing that the town wants to buy this bog and so other people can enjoy it. Um, the one thing that I did want to talk about here is that Mr. Ricker, floods the bog typically the first week of January for a couple of months. The amount of kids that come out and play ice hockey on that bog, and not just hockey, but people who come out and skate for a couple months out of the year, granted, you have to have the perfect conditions for that, but is that something that will be able to be maintained? For the last 16 years that I've been there, this is always something that's been part of that community. Yes, that's something that we'll maintain. So will that be a town responsibility or would that be the responsibility of the person managing the bog? It's the responsibility of the person managing the bog. It's, it's not flooded for the purpose of ice skating. It's Understood. flooded for the purpose of protecting the vines. Understood. So as long as the conditions are right for him to do that, um, then it would continue. So a second point yeah. on the management of the bog. Again, there's a very beautiful bog and there's, there's absolutely n no equipment, no broken down trucks, backhoes, any type of equipment on these bogs at all. They're all stored very, uh, very neatly in Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ricker's uh, barn. Uh, so in, during the management agreement, oh, is there any kind of uh, language in the management agreement that will prohibit 
the, the, uh, the grower from storing excess material. Obviously, there's going to be material in, during the harvest week, but that's one week a year. Right. Um, I am not sure offhand if there's anything explicitly saying that, but as I mentioned, the grower um, that will most likely enter into the agreement with, we have experience with, and he maintains his bogs meticulously as well. Not as meticulously as, as the Rickers, but <laughs> it would be hard so, to meet that <laughs> far. So, so is it possible that some of the, uh, the abutters, if, if this moves forward, it becomes a town property, is it possible that some of the abutters of the bog can be um, could see the management agreement or be part of the process of the management agreement before it is actually signed? Um, if I could, the article itself, the motion itself says that the um, very end of the article, uh, into, can end, conservation commission to enter into a management agreement from time to time for up to 10 years as may be necessary for the purpose of this article on such terms deemed by the select board in consultation with the conservation commission in the best interest of the town. So my suggestion is if this goes forward, it's something that the Board of Selectmen and the Conservation Commission will, will be taking up and that's where this discussion can go. So there's, there will be dialogue about the management of this bog as, if we move forward, is that what I'm hearing? Does anybody on the Board of Selectmen have anything to say about this? I'm seeing yes from the Board of Selectmen. As the, as the current chair, Fernando Guitar, yes. Does that work for you? It does. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Any other questions? The gentleman in the back on my left. Donald Wheeler, Nancy's next door neighbor in Millbrook Way. Um, I was surprised when I heard 1.6 million. The paper says 1.5. You had an extra $100,000. Where is it coming from? Um, I think I had that on a slide. So the 1.5 is um, the um, appraisal. I'll be able to go back. Um, 1.5 is based on an appraisal done in January of this year, and then the extra 100,000 is for associated costs, such as survey work, legal fees, and the conservation restriction. The question was, where is the money coming from to cover that 100,000? So that is, um, that didn't change. Um, the the um, financial considerations that we laid out was um, totaling 1.6 million. So um, the 600,000 from the undesignated CPA fund, 300 from water, 100 from open space, and then 600 in borrowing. So that total is 1.6. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. This is a borrowing article, and it will take a two-thirds vote to pass. Um, so it's when the green light comes on, if you're in favor of it, press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. Um, voting is now open. Voting is closed. Voting article passes 309 to 55. Mrs. Sullivan, on to article number three, and I just have a comment before, before yes, I ask you for a motion. This is to increase the Community Preservation Act surcharge so that people are clear about the process. This is the first step as to whether or not this are, we increase the, the uh, charge. Very first step is to get town meeting, the legislative body of the town, to vote in favor of this. If you vote in favor of this, it will then go to a vote, ballot vote at the very next scheduled town election 
which is in March of 2023, the next town election. So this is the first step. Um, if it passes, it goes on to the ballot. If it fails, then it's over. So just to understand, we have a, you would have another step to go through if this were to actually be in, be in place. May I, have a, may I have a motion, Mrs. Sullivan? Article three, increase to the Community Preservation Act surcharge. I move that the town increase the surcharge imposed under section three of chapter 44B of this general laws, the Community Preservation Act from 1% to 3% of the taxes assessed annually on real property, starting with taxes assessed for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2023. Said vote being contingent upon the approval of said increase by the voters of the town of Duxbury at the next regularly scheduled municipal election. Second. Um, select board uh, voted 5-0 to recommend. Finance committee voted 7-0 to recommend. And fiscal advisory also unanimously voted 7-0 to recommend. Ms. Morris. Are we having a presentation behind me? Yes. Then I think I will get out of the way. Um, good evening. I'm Holly Morris, and I am the chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, thank you all for attending this evening. Um, I represent a committee that has Tony Kelso, who is our town historian and member at large, Tag Carpenter from the Historic Commission, Kathy Cross from the Open Space, Kathy Palmer, member at large, David Udy, Planning Board, and myself, Conservation Commission. Today I'd like to talk about returning the CPA surcharge to the original 3%. And I have to say this is a hard conversation, especially in this environment, but in the 1970s, during a recessionary period, Duxbury acquired an outstanding amount of land. To protect our water supply and the character of our town, we acquired Bay Farm, Thaddeus Chandler, Lansing Bennett Forest, the North Hill. North Hill was actually being faced with a development of up to 700 housing units at the time. Wading Hill was acquired in the 80s and Camp Wing was acquired in the 90s. Long-term borrowing was the only means to make this happen. In 2002, we adopted the Community Preservation Act at the 3% level. That is 3% of your real property tax bill. Only 3% towns receive multiple rounds of funding from the state CPA trust fund. The trust fund receives money from fees on real estate transactions at the Registry of Deeds. Let's see if I can make this work. 10% of all CPA funds, your surcharge, and state matching funds are deposited into open space. Another 10% is in historic preservation, and another 10% in affordable housing. We don't have to spend it right away, it can be banked. CPA funds can also pay for recreation. Usually that comes from the undesignated fund balance, which is our reserve, or the open space account. We also put 5% of our revenue into the administrative account to pay for salaries, legal fees, and consultants. What is remaining rolls into the undesignated fund balance, or our reserve, and this is now paying our debt service. The estimated adjusted balances for fiscal year 23, our surcharge receipts are roughly around 602,000. Our debt service is over 200,000. The open space account balance is at this point now 111,000. Historic account 238,000. Housing account 158,000. And the undesignated fund balance is roughly 460,000. The state match is yet to be determined. In 2020, we received a 28.6% match, 
whereas 3% towns that we are ranked with, and that includes Nantucket, Harwich, Marshfield, Brewster, North Andover, Weston, and Sudbury, received on average 32.6%. So we're talking about Duxbury 28.6, the 3 percenters 32.6. In 21, in fiscal year 21, we received a 43.8% match due to supplemental funds in January, but the 3% towns received on average a 50% match. I need some water. So we're talking about last year getting 43.8%, the three percenters got 50%. And this is an outstanding return on your money. And if you know of any other investment that you're in where you're getting 43% back, let us know. So why is the CPA surcharge reduced? In 2013, Duxbury undertook three major capital projects, the new school, the new police department, and expansion of the fire station. At the ballot, the CPA surcharge was reduced to 1% by the majority of voters. Our local surcharge receipts fell by two-thirds, as did our state match. This resulted in a loss of nearly $9 million in local surcharge receipts and 2.4 million in state matching funds. In that same year, we adopted two exemptions to the act, property owned and occupied by a person who qualifies for low income housing or moderate or low income senior housing is exempt from the surcharge. And the first $100,000 value of your real property is also exempt. It's slow. <laughs> there we go. What this bar chart shows you is that for the first five years, when we were a 3% town, we were generating $1 million in surcharge receipts, and it was being matched one to one by the state. So we were getting $2 million to work with for five years. And we put that money to work, as you can see. The the blue bar is the surcharge receipts, the yellow bar is the state matching fund, and the green bar is what we spent. During the first five years, some of the projects that we spent the money on was the O'Neill Farm, Berry Brook Field, Camp Wing, Howlands Landing Park, and the Town Hall and Wright Building restorations. Eventually, other towns in the Commonwealth realized that this was such a great deal that they then came on board and the state matching funds were falling, they were reducing. Um, this was anticipated, but it was still, our returns were very good. Oh, come on. Of the accomplishments, we have spent 29 million of CPA funds to support over 58 projects. Of that, 10 million came from state matching funds, 5 million from state and federal grants. And again, in 2020, our state match was 28.6%, and in 2021, it was 43.8%. We have protected over 1,000 acres of land, protecting well fields, farmlands, wetlands, scenic vistas, forests, and streams. 20% of funds have been spent on historic preservation. And let me point out that 85% of that money went towards town-owned buildings, such as the Wright Building, Tar Kiln, Old Town Hall, the library, cemeteries, and preservation of the town clerk's records, 
and the World War, World War I Memorial. Housing for disabled adults and Habitat for Humanity homes were built on land purchased with CPA funds. Essentially, this is just a chart showing you that open space has taken the lion's share of our revenue. Um, then historic was the next one. Um, um, affordable housing and recreation. I'm going to give you a slideshow, and we're going to run through this rather quickly. What I want to point out is how we go through the process of selecting um, articles to bring to you, the town meeting. Proposals are received. A presentation is presented to the CPC by the proponents. The CPC undergoes an evaluation. Does the project meet the requirements of the act? Is it consistent with the open space and recreation plan? Is it consistent with the town's master plan and any other planning document? Does it protect the resources of our town, protect the character of Duxbury, provide passive or active recreation, or serve a currently underserved population? We evaluate the costs and benefits and often work with and advise the proponents to leverage the project with additional funds and then we meet with other boards and committees, such as the Select Board, uh, Finance Committee, and Fiscal Advisory for their endorsement. All meetings are public, with the exception of meetings for land that may have a detriment, which may have a detrimental effect on the strategizing and negotiating position of the town. Finally, you decide whether the project is to be funded. can't talk and do this at the same time. All right. Ugh. Well, this is the right building. And this was one of the first projects that we had done. Um, and as you can see, we paid quite a fair amount of money. This building, if you remember, was actually mothballed. And we brought it back to life. The front end of the building is the archive for the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. The back end is used by the kids in the public school. Come on. Bluefish River Firehouse. Thanks to Nancy Bennett. This was a tremendous project. Um, we spent $9,800 on this project, and it also garnered um, $20,000 in donations, and a number of people provided supplies and labor. Duxbury Free Library Restoration. Oh. This is painfully slow. In there? Oh, oh, oh. Next slide. All right. Tar Kiln. Um, again, this is something. Terry Vos and friends at Tar Kiln were responsible for this restoration. Um, we spent $595,000 on this, but it also garnered um, a, a tremendous amount of donations and supplies. Next slide. Old Town Hall Preservation, um, $250,000 for the exterior. Next slide. The um, Miles Standish um, house, former house site, is now on the National Register. Next slide. The World War I Memorial. Joe Shea found this in pieces in the DPW yard, and we were able to um, expend $75,000, and it also garnered $28,000 in donations, and we put it back together again. 
Next slide, please. Simmons Farm. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, um, but again, this was a recent acquisition. It has 17 acres of land around it, which will be in the, under the purview of the Conservation Commission. The house, the barn that was built in the 80s, and about three acres of land are hopefully to be sold. Um, there were also two lots in the corner of the property that the Duxbury Affordable Housing Trust has control over, and it's uncertain as to what they're going to be doing with that property, um, but they are working ardently on that one. Next slide, please. Keene Mill, again, another restoration project on Keene Street. Next, please. Um, we spent a fair amount of money on um, the two graves, um, graveyards in Duxbury doing restoration on the gravestones, fencing, signage. Next, please. Historic O'Neill Farm. This is tremendous. It was a $4.3 million acquisition, but we spent $1.5 yeah, $1 million of CPA funds, 140 acres of land. This has been in the O'Neill family for six generations since the 1800s, and it's still being farmed. Can you imagine if that field was now a housing development? Next, please. And that's a calf. Next, please. <laughs> Jay Cox Tree Farm, one of our first projects. This is the Christmas tree farm. Um, the, this actually attracts people from out of town. And the money that is um, received from those trees goes into a revolving fund and maintains the farm. Next, please. Blackfriar Swamp off of 53. Next, please. The Mary Properties. 17 parcels, which is incredible. Um, 277 acres, and again, I want shout out to Joe Grady for having, again, played such a major role in so much of our land protection. Um, if it wasn't for him, this may not have all happened, but again, he has developed over the years a very good relationship with the owners of these properties, and that's how we came to um, terms with the sale and so forth. Next, please. Barry Brook Hayfield, this pays, this grows the hay for the O'Neill farm. Next, please. Camp Wing Conservation Land. Um, when we acquired this, we also set aside three acres of land for affordable housing, which is the Feinberg Bog Road. Next, please. Howlands Landing Park, five acres for three million. This allowed people to have access to the nook, that area, um, and to be able to just enjoy the open space on Stand Ashore. Next, please. Round Pond, we bought the Loring, Loring Nud and O'Brien Bogs. And this is Round Pond, many of you probably walk around there. Next. Pink Cranberry Farm, we purchased this last year. This is, again, an active bog. Next. Island Creek Fish Ladder. What amazes me is how old this is. This is 1702. <laughs> um, this was an amazing project in that we used CPA funds. We also received money from the state and the federal governments and donations. I believe it was Battelle was one of the large donors to bring this fish run back to use again. Next, please. Pickleball courts, very popular. <laughs> this is one of them um, over at Tark Hill. Next, please. And this is the new set that's over near the library in Alden. Next, please. Turf field. We spent 500,000 of CPA funds doing the site work on this project. You cannot use CPA money to pay for turf, artificial turf. Um, but Pride did a fundraising effort for $880,000, very successful, and covered that expense. 
Next, please. The play field on Keene Street. Next. Baseball and softball dugouts throughout town. Next, please. The Delano Farm. On this property, when we acquired it, there is a well, well site. There was also a single family home, which now is the home for, uh, it's a, for a lower income family. And also we provided the land so that a house could be built for adults with disabilities. Next, please. The Grange acquisition. This was acquired um, initially for a single family home. It could not be restored. It had to be torn down and in its place is a single family home, for, again, for a low income family. Next. This is the Feinberg Bog that I talked about. Six housing units. It's um, mixed use income. Next, please. We also provide grants to the nonprofits. Um, such as for the King Caesar House, which is owned by the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. Next, please. The Alden House um, by the Alden Kindred. Next. Nathaniel Windsor House, Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. Next. The Bradford House Museum, which is the Historical Society. Next. The Isaac Keene Barn, which is at Crossroads for Kids. Um, this was, at one point, the largest barn in town. <laughs> Next, please. The first parish church. Um, we provided grants for the building itself and also for the church records, um, which are currently on loan. They, they have been preserved, and they are on loan with the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. Next, please. In American Legion Hall, if you have noticed, um, our signs are out in front. We just restored the entire exterior on that. Next, please. So why should we return to the 3%? First of all, it is to preserve our quality of life. But what is most important is that open space protection protects our most valuable resource, and that is water. And redundancy in well sites is absolutely vital. Um, I can recall at least two well sites that have had to be shut down because of contamination, and therefore the water department certainly is, it is in the best interest to make sure that there are other well sites that have sufficient land around them so that they are protected. We are also promoting excuse me, protecting wetlands, streams, wildlife habitat, and farmland. And remember that streams flow into our marsh and the bay, which supports an important fishery, and as you know, a shellfish industry. CPA also provides the preservation of historic structures and landscapes, and our unique history attracts buyers who value history and it brings in tourism dollars. Affordable housing, it is important for people with disabilities, seniors, young families, and veterans. And if we had more money, we should have greater control of the types of developments that are being done in this town and who they best serve. Having more money allows greater leverage and control. And for recreation for all ages, because this is a very active community. Next slide, please. Remember, only 3% towns receive additional rounds of funding from the state trust fund. Competition with developers demands a timely response. It draws down our CPA reserves, and now our only option is borrowing. We have two million in debt outstanding. Now with the RICR, it's 2.6. And the hard facts are, that the median household, the CPA surcharge, which is currently $64, if we go up to the 3%, it will be increased to 192, or $48 quarterly. Next slide, please. This again is the Simmons Farm. 
Again, the town considered exercising its right of first refusal for this farmland when the owner passed away. We were challenged by a developer who threatened to build a very sizable development that grew larger as the town challenged him. Also, a 40B was in the permitting process across the street. This led to a public outcry for the protection of the historic character of the neighborhood. Litigation ensued and we prevailed. And we had to respond quickly with the acquisition for 2.23 million. We drew down all of the CPA accounts and borrowed. The farmhouse barn and three acres of the land is to be sold. The field will remain in conservation and two lots, as I had mentioned, are under the control of the Duxbury Affordable Housing Trust. Next slide, please. This is not Duxbury. <laughs> this is Lincoln. Um, a bunch of us went up to look at Lincoln years ago to see how they did farming on their conservation land. And farming has been extremely, em it's been embraced by the community in Lincoln. It provides local food, community gardens, supports farmers who care about improving the soil and care of their livestock. It supports a food pantry and education to children. It is highly successful in Lincoln and we hope to bring back more farming to Duxbury. Next, please. CPA protects the most valuable resources, and again, at the top of the list is water. It supports sound planning and balanced growth. The state matches a tremendous return on your investment. We received 43.8% in 2021, and as a 3% town, we may have received up to 50%. This is why this program is so successful in the Commonwealth. A yes vote will return the CPA surcharge to 3% and puts it on the ballot in March. We couldn't bring this to the Springtown meeting because the ballots have to be printed 30 days before the spring elections. And if any changes were made at the Springtown meeting, the ballot could not be changed. Finally, this is about who we are and what we want our town to become, what we want to leave behind to our children, to the next generations, as did generations before us. Please support the return to the 3%. Thank you. So we're now open to any questions or comments that people might have. I think I see somebody on my right making their way to the, to the microphone. Please. Hi, I'm Beth Halligan. I'm 110 Rogers Way. I'm speaking uh, right now on behalf of the Fiscal Advisory Committee. Mrs. Sullivan stated that we voted seven to one in favor of this uh, article. It, that vote was not based on the substance of the article, but we believe very strongly that this uh, article should go to the March uh, election. Thank you. Gentleman over here on my left. Good evening, uh, Lachlan Cleary, 31 Chandler Mill Drive. I guess my question, and I can certainly appreciate all the protection of open space in this town and the historic buildings and all that. I guess my question is, you know, I have three young children in this town, and I'm sure many people have young children in this town that play on the fields in this town. And as I look at the funds, my understanding is there's five uses for the funds, and one of those is for the you know, rehabilitation and upkeep of the fields in town. And as I look around at the fields and the recreation, and I, I know I appreciate and thank you for some of the things you did show that you've uh, approved, improved in town, I guess my concern is that maybe not enough of the funds are being allocated to things that probably hundreds, if not a thousand kids in this town are using in terms of the fields and things like that. So I guess I'd love to understand, you know, a little bit more of the process of 
how do we decide what where we spend our money? Mm -hmm. um, again, understanding that you know what you're doing now is is very important, and I appreciate you know keeping Duxbury in the rural fashion and you know beautiful nature that it is. So, um, but I think there's you know talking to you know I coach several teams in town, and I think there's a lot of people here that have asked sort of the same things like you know can we make sure that we're going to spend some All of right. this money if we're going to increase this on more recreation things that many of the kids in town uh, will benefit from. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Morris, before, it, Ms. Yeah, before right you, it's the voice from on high. Yeah. Be, before you answer that question, um, Mr. Cleary, I understand your concern. This is not about how we will be committing to spending money in the future. But nonetheless, I understand the discussion needs to go forward about how, perhaps, how you set your priorities and how you but share gonna, out the money. But if we're going to commit to spending the money, we'd like to understand where the money is going to go to. That's, that's what my question is, and, and how and, and I think that, that it goes, goes that far, and that's a good, certainly a wonderful question. It's a very good question. Um, I will point out that we actually just received a bunch of requests, <laughs> um, many of which are recreation. Um, funding, as, as I have pointed out, is extremely limited right now. This is why we are trying to go forward on the 3% so we can address things such as that. Um, I think, again, we, we cover four things. It is open space, historic preservation, affordable housing and recreation. And certainly if we are, if a proposal is submitted to us, we will by all means review it and work with whomever is presenting it um, and certainly with the school department or the recreation department, whoever may be sponsoring it. Um, but again, it comes down to whether we have sufficient funding and right now we don't. And we certainly would like to have sufficient funding to meet those needs. Any other questions or comments? The gentleman in my right has been patiently standing at the microphone. Hi, uh, Jim Hartford, uh, 184 Surplus Street. I'm here tonight uh, in my role as the interim executive director of the Historical Society. Um, society certainly has been a beneficiary of, of CPA CPC funding over the years. I wanted to just point out that um, the society was for formed in 1883 at a time when there were no municipal organizations that were in the business of uh, historic preservation, uh, site line pr preservation, neighborhood preservation, and land acquisition for purposes of open space. Society owns, in addition to its historic structures of the King Caesar House, the Bradford House, the maintenance of the archives at the Wright Building, um, and a number of other significant properties, we own and steward approximately 150 acres of open space. Um, we get about 45,000 visits a year on these properties. We also have educational programming that we run um, that, that uh, involves around 1,100 students every year. We have tremendous amount of overlap with other organizations within the town of Duxbury in, these, in the pursuit of these um, undertakings of historic preservation, open space stewardship, and educational programming. Um, we have, we like to think that we engage in these things as in a collaborative environment with the town, as, as partners uh, in these undertakings, and the importance of our properties, our activities, and other nonprofits that are community-based within, within the town of Duxbury cannot be overstated in terms of their impact on both the visual and fabric of the town. Um, and so I just wanted to note that the uh, board did meet and did vote in, uh, unanimously in favor of supporting this increase um, back the restoration of the 3% overall contribution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, good evening, Mr. Moderator. Benjamin Cronin, 17 Pill Hill Lane. Uh, I just want to urge the entire town meeting to support, uh, to vote yes on this article. I think there are a number of reasons. I'll be brief. Uh, 
The first is one that was adverted to, I believe, by a member of the community, I'm sorry for this microphone, uh, a member of the Community Preservation Committee, uh, committee who talked about the need for self-determination, that this increase in the surcharge will give the town the ability to determine in a democratic fashion, all expenditures are through the town meeting on the CPC, uh, what the future of the town looks like. And uh, that could be different things. That's up to future town meetings. The second thing that I think this article does that's positive is that it helps us avoid false choices. We've seen discussions uh, in, in local public fora that kind of pit conservation and affordable housing against each other. I'd suggest uh, that that's a false premise, that we can have both, and in fact, the act explicitly mentions, it's mentioned in the statute, not only affordable housing or community housing, it says, uh, but also environmental preservation. Uh, and of course, uh, historical preservation, and there are uh, additions. Uh, the previous speaker, of course, noted the popularity of playing fields. Finally, I'd say it's, or not finally, second to finally, uh, it's fiscally prudent. We uh, often find communities are sort of given a, a, a false, uh, again, false choice. We have to develop and uh, what's the solution to the costs that are incurred by development of greater services from the town? Well, we'll develop some more and it becomes a Ponzi scheme, essentially, the same logic. And so it's actually fiscally uh, prudent in my mind. It may be somewhat painful and I'm sensitive to that pain that people, especially on fixed incomes, do have. However, uh, it's an issue in my mind of being penny wise versus pound f or in pound foolish. We don't want to have to spend more money later. Uh, finally, I think Mrs. Morris did a good job showing precisely how uh, central this is to the fabric of our community. So for all those reasons, Mr. Moderator, I'd urge the town meeting to support this article. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two, two more people who have been patiently waiting to, with, with questions. Um, do either one of you have a question, or is it more uh, a suggestion how people should vote? No, I wish to speak uh, against the article. That, that's, that's fine. Um, wonderful. So we'll go ahead and we have two people waiting and maybe we're easing up on a vote. Um, please go ahead and identify yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm Eve Penoyer. I live at 59 Tussock Brook Road and I I'm a financial professional. Um, I'm speaking against the article not because I oppose the wonderful work of, that we've been able to do with the CPA, um, but for a very similar reason that I spoke vehemently in favor of going down from 3% to 1% some years ago. In my opinion, we can't afford it. This is probably the worst imaginable time to be asking taxpayers to triple a tax. We're in an era of historic, rampant inflation. Everyone is feeling it. Every day, every week you go to the grocery store. In addition, those who follow the financial news may have seen the release of the report today. Almost 50 of this country's leading economists, overwhelmingly in a survey, have stated that within the next 12 months, there is a 100% probability that this country will be in a recession. Asking taxpayers to pay more is inappropriate at this time. Perhaps in the future, when our economy is in better condition, we feel we can comfortably afford it, I would very much be in favor of it, of it but not at this time. I feel that at this time, economically, it is vital that we tighten our belts because the storm is, is here and it's going to get worse. Thank you. May I respond to that? Um, I'm not looking for a back and forth, but, but if you have some comments that no. are on target, not personal, I'll be glad to hear them. We recognize that, believe me. Um, we were trying to bring this whole we were proposal years ago and then COVID hit, um, and we couldn't meet to do the work that we had to do. It, it is certainly, it's a difficult time. And as I pointed out at the beginning of the talk, Duxbury, you know, despite being in a recession, acquired the most tremendous amount of land in Duxbury that it has ever done. Um, the work, there's a lot of work to be done. And we know, you know, this, this may present some hardships for some people, but on the other hand, 
Time is important. We do have developers that are very interested in our town, as, as you are well aware, and in, sometimes it's not, a, you know, some of their projects um, may be encroaching too much in certain neighborhoods as what was happening with the Simmons farm, and we have to respond rapidly. If that property is in Chapter 61, which is property that has been paying reduced taxes over the years, and there's an opportunity to acquire it for various purposes, whether it be recreation, open space, even housing, affordable housing, then so be it. But if we don't have the funds, we can't do anything. And right now, we are at the bottom. Thank you. Uh, gentleman on my right, and then there's a woman w waiting over here on my left. Hi, I'm Mark McDevitt, Chestnut Street. Um, I thought I was going to be, uh, you know, 307 votes to one. I'm voting against this article. Um, my real question is not to the CPA. Um, my question has to do with the select board and the, you know, Committee of Finance who sound like they unanimously support this on both sides. And I'm thinking in the context of the rapid inflation that we're in right now, the 25, 30% increases on some capital items that were recently reported in the Clipper, you know, increases of what was originally budgeted. And you guys who are on the select board and the Committee of Finance know the numbers a lot better. What are we facing? coming March. Are you guys already envisioning a Prop 2 and a half override to keep current services where they are? I don't feel comfortable voting until we have some hard numbers on what we're truly being asked to increase our taxes by another 2% on top of a 4% override. Anybody on those boards want to speak to what they see coming down the road? Thank you. Uh, may I also, I need to respond to that. 3%, it's not an additional 2% on your taxes. It's 2% of your, the taxes that you pay. Understood. Okay. Is, when, when, Mrs., when Ms. Morris makes that statement, are people confused by what that means? Would you like a better explanation? All those in favor of a better explanation, raise your hand. So right now, you are paying 1% of what your tax bill is. That's the CPA surcharge. It's not an additional 1%. That's fine. I misspoke. Could I have the opinion of the Committee of Finance and the Select Board, please? Well, we, we can ask them if they have any comments. Fernando, you were mentioned first. Do you have a comment? You deferred, you deferred to Mrs. Sullivan. Mrs. Sullivan. I am also concerned about um, inflation, recession, what we're facing, um, as been pointed out by a previous speaker, for the next 12 months. Um, in the position of looking at uh, municipal finance, although we do a budget every 12 months, you have to take a longer view. And the uh, longer view is that many things that have been supported by these funds, which were in part um, a rebate from the state uh, have helped us retain things that seem to be important to people in Duxbury per any survey or uh, gathering of information that we get. Also, if indeed the um, population feels that this is an inappropriate time, the vote that would seal the deal is after town meeting. So the questions that you ask about the budget, and we've just started our deliberations, we're just getting budgets back, we're just starting our work. Um, so I really can't answer that. There, I will tell you there has been no conversation about any override in my presence. But the, those, that information will be blatantly clear because we will have just voted it two weeks before this vote is taken. So any questions that you might have on that arena will be will be made clear before the vote. So this tonight you vote to give yourself a, a chance to think about it and vote again. Thank you. You're welcome. 
A woman over here on my left um, has been patiently waiting, and then I'll get to you, sir, and then maybe we'll think about a vote. Madam? Sheila Lynch Benton in 344 West Street. I would like to support a yes vote on question three. In a strange way, um, Warren Buffett says, you buy when there's great fear and you sell when everyone is complacent. And the next three years will be a great opportunity for Duxbury to really address affordable housing while the developers and the real estate industry takes a break. I'd like to uh, define further who's exempt from the CPC. Any senior over age 60, one person household, 98,000, two person household, $112,000, three person, 126, up to eight people. If you earn 185,000, you are exempt from this 3% overcharge. Also, all the low-income people in town are exempt from this surcharge. A one-person household, if you earn less than 78,000, two-person, 89,000, three-person, up to eight, 148. So people who truly can't afford it in town are exempt from it. Others of you that can afford it the next three years are a perfect opportunity to address affordable housing in this town. Locally, you, we need 10% in order to push back against 40B developments. Cohasset's at 10%, Hanover's at 11%, Hingham's at 11.4%, Marshfield is heading to 10%, Duxbury is only at 7.8% affordable housing. That means we have to do 121 more units in the next few years. If we, le if we don't pass a 3% CPA, it means that 20 more developments of 28 units can happen anywhere in this town. And do a Warren Buffett move. Move it up, if you can afford it, to 3%. Let's really address affordable housing Let's push back on the awful 40Bs that are happening in this town. Let's have uh, um, finance the Affordable Housing Trust to do senior rental housing and fund it. So if you can afford it, which most in the town can afford a few hundred, the next three years will be very important for affordable housing. Don't lose this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman at the microphone. Jim Sullivan, Carriage Lane. Um, while proponents of tripling the C CPA may be well intended, um, it's ill advised and unnecessary. You know, the Clippeth headlined an article a week or two ago about the impending dramatic escalation of the cost to run the town, just the basic functions of managing the services. It's, we're on the front end of that escalation, and directly connected to that escalation will be a commensurate increase in the basic real estate taxes in town. So this CPA is just the tip of an iceberg that's growing bigger instead of melting. All right, it, it has to be put in context. We have this mushrooming of expenses facing us in every area. It's coming in the housing, it's coming in the heating of the homes, it's coming in the food, and not minuscule increases. As the financial advisor spoke earlier, it's coming and it's coming without a doubt. Now, I'd like to make one important point. All of the projects that have been viewed were done for the last 10 years at a 1% CPA tax. You know, we've been doing many projects in a very controlled fashion 
in terms of the 1%. We can continue doing projects at a 1% level. It has done the job, has done a very good job, obviously. So increasing it is really unnecessary. Increasing it will just raise the opportunity for projects that maybe aren't even warranted. We're managing the ship now at 1% very well. One other point, please. One of the slides showed that when the reduction was achieved 10 years ago, there was, quote, a loss of $9 million of revenue. Well, you know where that revenue stayed? In the taxpayers' pockets, all right? It was not a loss. It has to be viewed in the right context. Discretion was mentioned. Yeah, discretion is best in your pocket if you're already managing a project very well. So on that point, I would simply say enough at 1%. It does the job, and I would vote against this article. Thank you. Thank you. Are we ready for a vote? I mean, my sense is that we're, we've, we were hearing what people have to say and how they feel about this, which is, which is important, but no particular questions about the mechanics or purposes. So with, with that, um, I'm going to ask for a vote on article number three. Um, if you're in favor of it, um, it's one. If you're opposed, two. Voting is now open. Voting is closed. And the article passes 279 to 80. 279 yes, 80 no. For, for the few people who might decide to leave, I'd ask you to please, please, please put your, return your voting device. It doesn't work to change your TV channel. It doesn't work on your garage, but it's valuable to us. Is there something that's brand new that we, is there a new fact that we know now that we didn't know a minute ago? It, motion's out of order. I think, I think we'll wait just a couple of minutes before we start the next article. It's a little noisy. Next up is article number four, which is union contracts. Um, we do have some contracts to bring before town meeting, so Mrs. Sullivan, if you would give us a motion under article number four. Article four, motion one, Duxbury Free Library employees, I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $20,550 for the purpose of funding a collective bargaining agreement with the Duxbury Free Library employees Service Employees International Union, Local 888, for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2022, and ending June 30th, 2025. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions about the, about the motion? Select Board voted 301 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 90 to recommend. 
Seeing no questions, um, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor, press one. All those in opposed, press two. Voting is closed. Article passes 128 to 27. 120, 120, I'm sorry, 128, yes, 17, no. 17, no. Mrs. Sullivan, the second motion for this article. Duxbury DPW employees, I move that the town appropriate the sum of $112,820 for the purpose of funding a collective bargaining agreement with Duxbury DPW employees, AFS CME Council 93, Local 1700, for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2022, and ending June 30, 2025, and to meet said appropriation, raise and appropriate the sum of $93,520 and transfer $19,300, which shall come from the Water Enterprise Fund Reserve. Second. Selectman voted 5-0 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 9-0 to recommend. Are there any questions or comments about this motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor of it, press 1. All those opposed, press 2. Voting is open. Voting is now closed. Motion passes 126 yes, 20 no. Article number five. Mrs. Sullivan, before you say anything, I just want to make a comment about Article five. Uh, the motion you're about to hear will, will, will not deal with a finance director town accountant position. That, has not, that was not being moved at this time. So if you have a warrant in front of you, if you go to page eight and you look at article number five, on the second line, if you strike the language that starts a finance director slash town accountant position end, and if you struck that language, the motion you're about to hear um, is reflected in that article. What's happening is there's only one of the positions is going forward, not both positions. Mrs. Sullivan, can we have a motion, please? I move that the town amend the Town of Duxbury Personnel Policies Part 4 Pay Schedule Table by adding a Board of Health Inspector position and to fund said amendments raise and appropriate the sum of $15,720. Such funds to be expended under the direction of the town manager. Second. Select Board voted 5-0 to recommend. Finance Committee voted 9-0 to recommend. Any, any questions or comments on the article? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor say, um, all those in favor press one, all those opposed press two. Voting is now open. Voting is now closed. Motion passes 125 to 23. 125 to, to 23. Article 6, Mrs. Sullivan, and before you say anything, I just have a comment about it. Um, two things. Um, this is for unpaid bills from the previous fiscal year. As everybody may know, the fiscal year ends on June 30th. The new fiscal year starts on July the 1st. If bills aren't in in a timely way, <clears throat> the way that they get paid is by taking those bills and taking them out of this year's appropriation, this year's budget. Um, in, and the other thing is, 
it takes a nine-tenths vote, a nine-tenths vote for this to pass because we're, we're paying last year's expenses with this year's money. So that having been said, Mrs. Sullivan, if you'll lead us. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $21,669.65 and transfer the sum of $21,669.65 from free cash to pay the following unpaid bills as follows. One, Lycar for the fire department, $249.34. Two, RICO, municipal services, $263.09. Three, RICO for the DPW administration, $131.08. Uh, four, Comcast business for the cemetery department, $10.51. Five, Verizon, DPW administration, $3,472.37. Number six, complete recycling for the transfer station, $175. Uh, number seven, South Shore disposal, central buildings, $13,213.51. Eight, Eversource gas for the cemetery, $2,076.79. Uh, nine, Troop Waste and Recycling, DPW Transfer Station, $482.96. 10, Advantage Drug Testing, LLC, Human Resources, $745, $745. Advantage Drug Testing, LLC, Human Resources, $365. Number 12, Sullivan Tire, no relation. DPW Highway, $485, for a total of $21,669.65. Second. Select, voted, select board voted 5-0 to recommend, Finance Committee 7-0 to recommend. Any comments or questions about this article? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. Again, it needs to be a 9 tenths vote. Um, if you're in favor of it, you'll press 1, oppose, press 2. Voting is now open. Motion passes 136 to 10. Thank you, I didn't even really need to do higher mathematics to make sure it passed. Mm -hmm. Article number seven, Mrs. Sullivan. I move to indefinitely postpone this article. Second. Recommended 5-0 to by the selectmen and 9-0 to indefinitely postpone by finance. Does anybody have a question about that? Seeing none, I'll take a vote, a majority vote. All those in favor of indefinitely postponing article number seven, I press one. All those opposed, press two. Voting's open. Motion passes 136 to 6. 136 yes, 6 no. Article number 8, Mrs. Sullivan. Supplemental capital appropriations. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $391,543 to supplement appropriations previously voted under articles 6 and seven at the annual town meeting of March 12, 2022, with an additional item from Article 6 of the annual town meeting of August 1, 2020, for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2022, and to fund said supplemental transfer to fund said supplement transfer from free cash 391,543 
for the line items in the budgets of various town departments as follows. Article 6, item 11, police, dispatch console replacement update. It was budgeted for 41500 The adjustment is $873 for a revised capital budget of $42,373, funds from free cash. From Article 7, item number 4, police, a utility trailer. The budget was 11142 The adjustment is $4,101 for a revised capital budget of $15,243, money from free cash. Article 6, item number 12, fire department, to replace the forest fire unit, the brush breaker. The budget was 488000 Adjustment is 37636 Revised capital budget is 525636 Original budget funded by borrowing. Adjustment being sought to fund through free cash. Article number 6, item 17, lands and natural resources. Replace truck 23. The budget was $300,317. The adjustment is $82,433. The revised capital budget is $382,750. Money from free cash. Line article number six, item 23 from the cemetery to replace the retort computers. The budget was $29,574. The adjustment is $4,500. The revised capital budget is $34,074. Monies from free cash. Um, article 6, item 23, Percy Walker Pool. This is FY21. Acid pool wash. The budget was $110,000. The adjustment is $262,000. Revised capital budget is 372000 the funds from free cash. Total adjustments, 391, 543. Recommendations, the select board voted 5-0 to recommend. Finance committee voted 7-0 to recommend. Second. And I believe we have a question in the back. Um, it's Sue Schofield, 30 James Road. It's more of a comment. Um, I'm seeing these numbers, yeah. and I imagine it's inflation. These, some of these numbers are huge over budget, and I know it's a sign of the times, and this is what we're talking about. The tip of the iceberg is just going up, up, up. And I, you know, and I know we have to do this. We have to pay our bills. I get it. But uh, everyone, beware. The storm is upon us. I hate to say it. I hate it. I'm worried about my neighbors who aren't going to be able to pay their bills. In Duxbury, we will pay our bills. but. Let's take care of our neighbors that are on fixed incomes. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, Eve Penoyer again, 59 Tussock Brook Road. Um, once again, I'm going to be the voice of um, fiscal conservatism. I'm socially liberal, but I'm very conservative fiscally. It seems to me that for the three really big ticket items on here, the um, brush breaker, truck 23, and uh, acid washing the pool, if we but wait 12 months, these prices will be a lot less. It seems to me none of these things could be so much of a critical emergency that we couldn't wait one year to expend for these capital expenditures because at that point with a recession we'll be able to get these things at a much lower cost. I want to make that point and urge that postponement of some of those three really big ticket items be considered. So do you wish to make a, I'm sorry, do you, are, are you making a motion to amend this? 
article that's before us. We're just suggesting that people be wary. Can't hear you. I, I apologize, but I can't hear you. She's asking if you're asking her to do that. I do not have a motion to amend written, but if someone uh, can assist me to put it in writing, I would be happy to offer it as a motion to amend the article. I've, I, I'm not sure how one goes right. about doing that. I think, I think I understand what you want to do, and perhaps town council, perhaps town council can help you with the wording on the motion. Having said that, um, perhaps the people who are dealing with with these particular items have a have a comment about why it's there or what's happened. Hi, good evening, Rob Reardon, fire chief. Um, one of the items is the brush breaker, just to bring you up to speed on what's going on. Like you, we're seeing drastic increases. We've already signed to buy a brush breaker, so we've agreed to this. The cost on the brush breaker is $485,000. That doesn't include any equipment. So the money we're asking for is equipment. We actually signed the deal in April. We got pricing, which was fairly decent. Wasn't as good as we wanted. Um, but if we were to sign today, we'd look at a 14% increase from that $485,000. Um, so we have a brush truck that's coming without equipment. So I would ask that you please support the additional. And if you'd introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, Steve Studley, Recreation Director. The one issue with the pool, and I understand it's a, it's a big number, um, the industry's you know, that's what's happening right now in the industry. However, the delay of a year for this project, you know, gives the potential for the pool to become unusable. The, I don't want to bore you with the chemistry behind it, but there's a thing called TDSs, total dissolved solids, and you need to keep those in balance in order to keep the water at a level you want to swim at, and a, a year's delay could be a, you know, critical to that situation. That's why it's important that we act on this sooner than later. Thank you. Nice to see you back up here, Mr. Butkus. Good to be here, Mr. Moderator. Um, <laughs> Peter Butkus, DPW Director. The Truck 23 is our aerial lift truck, our bucket truck, which is kind of a critical piece of apparatus for us during storms and just doing routine maintenance, tree removals so on and so forth. When we bring a capital vehicle to town meeting, we tr always try to build in a contingency, um, usually around 10%, um, just to deal with price escalations. In almost three decades here, I've never seen uh, this type of increase for, for equipment. Um, the only plus side is if we do replace this truck, the old truck will go to auction, and it should command a fairly high price. Thank you. Thank you.
Please, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were waiting for me. So we have a motion to amend. Um, to amend Article 8, uh, which will be retaking some items out of, the, out of the original motion that was made by Mrs. Sullivan. Those items are? Um, Eve Penoyer, 59 Tesserbrook Road. Um, I move to amend the current motion for Article 8 by striking items 12, 17, and 23 Percy Walker Pool, reducing the total appropriation by 382000 $69 for a new total appropriation of $9,474. And just, just to I'll say this out loud and make sure that we, we both agree, what you're taking out is the $37,636 $37, for the replacement for the forest fire unit, the brush breaker. Um, it's number 17, uh, 82000 $433 for the replacement truck for lands and natural resources. And then finally, the $262,000 for the acid pool watch, wash at the Percy Walker pool. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, that is correct. That's my okay. motion to amend. So we, now, so we now have a motion to amend the article. I'm going to ask you to vote on that amendment. Oh, do, well, we'll let... We'll, We'll, we now have a motion. We now have a motion that's been seconded. If you vote, if you want to see those items reduced out of the budget, press one. If you're opposed to the amendment, if you want the article as originally made, press two for no. One if you're in favor of the amendment, two for, two for no. Voting is now over. The motion, the amendment fails 26 to 122. So we're now back to the original, we're now back to the original article that was on the floor. Um, and I think we're ready for a vote on that. So I'm gonna ask people to, to be ready to vote when the green light goes on. One, if you're in favor of the article as, as moved by Mrs. Sullivan, press one. If you're opposed, press two. Voting is closed. Article passes 127 to 21. 127 to 21. Article 9, Mrs. Sullivan. I think we may get through this tonight. There you go. I move that the town appropriate the sum of 300,000 for the purpose of funding audiovisual support and equipment and to meet said appropriation, transfer the sum of 300,000 from the cable, television, public, educational, and governmental access funds, otherwise known as the PEG access fund, such funds to be expended under the direction of the school committee. Second. Select board voted 5-0 to recommend. Finance committee voted 7-0 to recommend. Fiscal voted 4-3-0. Do we have any questions? Okay, thank you. Without, any, without seeing any questions or comments, I'll ask for a vote on article number nine. All those in favor say press one, all those opposed press two. Voting is open. Voting is closed. Article passes 114 to 17. Article number 10, Mrs. Sullivan. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $60,000 for repairs and inspections to the Alden and Pack school roofs 
including any and all expenses incidental thereto and to meet said appropriation, transfer the sum of $60,000 from free cash, such funds to be expended under the direction of the school committee. Second. Select board voted 401 to recommend. Finance committee voted 7-0 to recommend. Any questions or comments out there? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. If you're in favor of Article 10 as presented, press 1. Opposed, press 2. Voting is open. Voting is closed and the article passes 116 to 12. Article 11, Mrs. Sullivan. I move to indefinitely postpone this article. Second. And Select board um, 5-0, Finance Committee 9-0 to indefinitely postpone. And as I look out, I think we have people who are used to town meeting and used to indefinitely postpone, but if, if you're confused by that article, by, by that name, it, mean, it doesn't mean yes or no, it just means it's pa being passed over. It's sometimes called Passover at, at some other town meetings. It can come back up at a future town meeting, but we're going to take no action. It's not yes or no, it's just taking no action. And so all those in favor of doing nothing, press 1. All those opposed, press 2. But, but um, Mr. Moderator? Yes, ma'am. The intent of the article to be indefinitely postponed is because the source of the funds is from a grant and had, there is no need for appropriation, not that the um, precautions and the safety measures aren't being, um, aren't being worked on. And uh, furthermore, the select board uh, voted uh, this evening to authorize the use of opera funding uh, for this purpose as town meeting approval is not required for the use of opera funds, so basically, we're getting the money to fund everything that's required for the schools uh, from opera funding and not uh, from taxation. So it's kind of good news. And applause from the back there, I like that. <laughs> all, those in <clears throat> all those in favor, press one. All those opposed, press two. Voting is now closed. Motion passes 124 to 1. Article 12, Mrs. Sullivan. I move that the town rescind the borrowing authorization for the following articles and the following unissued amounts. Um, the town meeting date of March 9th, 2019, Article 15, seawall repairs. Project authorization, $4,909,770. Total authorization to be rescinded, $3,724,770. In March 12, 2022 meeting, Article 6, Motion 5, the PFAS filtration article. Project authorization is $1,800,000. 800,000 total authorization to be rescinded, 1,800,000. Second. Select board voted 5-0 to recommend, finance 7-0 to recommend, and um, that's it. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. As you've heard before, one for yes, two for no. Voting is closed. <clears throat> Article passes 118 to 4. Final article of the night. Mrs. Sullivan, a, a motion for Article 13. 
sorry. I move that the town, upon recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, transfer $30,000 from the Community Preservation Historic Resources Reserve to preserve, stabilize, and prepare for sale the historic Isaac Simmons Farmhouse located at 761 Temple Street to be expended under the direction of the town manager in consultation with the Historic Commission. Second. Select board vote 5-0, finance 9-0 to recommend. Do we have any questions or comments? Sensing there are none, I'll ask for a vote on Article 13. All those in favor, press 1. All those opposed, press 2. Voting is open. Voting is closed. Motion passes 102 to 17. Um, that now concludes the, the business for the special town meeting. I want to thank people who came out and stayed to the end and helped the town do the important business. Uh, and so I will, I will entertain a motion to adjourn this town meeting. Sonny die. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. The ayes have it, the most we are adjourned. <laughs>